Right. Welcome everyone to our lecture 10 of BIS 103, still on the topic of fat and lipid metabolism. And in this video, what I want to focus on is the topic of ketone bodies and ketogenesis. So our learning goal for this video is that we want to be able to describe the formation of ketone bodies called ketogenesis and be able to explain the biological importance of ketone bodies. To do so, we first have to go back and think about the outcome of what we had discussed so far in carbohydrate and fatty acid catabolism. If we think about it in the bigger picture, what we have done essentially is that we took carbohydrates and took fatty acids and have broken them down through our catabolic pathways and the central metabolite that we ended up with was acetyl-CoA. Right? This was the product of your beta oxidation in the last lecture. It's also the product of the PDH reaction downstream of glycolysis and acetyl-CoA now is the central metabolite that is going into the TCA cycle for generating the electron carriers that then later can be used in the ETC to make ATP. But now thinking about all of these catabolic pathways funneling into acetyl-CoA, you could think about scenario where you're making too much, right? What if you produce too much acetyl-CoA? Keep in mind, you have your cofactor CoA bound in the acetyl moiety so if you make too much you could feasibly run into a cofactor problem. So we want to have basically a fail-safe mechanism here, an alternate way to deal with acetyl-CoA and for us these are ketone bodies, ketogenesis. So how does this work? Basically we're using a lot of the surplus acetyl-CoA and we're breaking it down into other metabolites that we can use then for energy metabolism. Before I go there, let's talk a little bit about why it is important. So ketone bodies, in essence, are energy-rich acetyl-CoA equivalents, and they are transportable. That's really important. So what they can do is they can actually circulate in the blood, they can be taken up by cells, and they can be converted into acetyl-CoA again, or other compounds that can be used for energy metabolism. So there's simply an equivalent that allows us to break down acetyl-CoA and free up our CoA cofactor, but we can still use these in this scenario for generating ATP. What is really curious is that they are actually formed in the liver and they're used by all organs, including the brain. Actually, they're small enough to pass a blood-brain barrier, but the only organ that cannot actually utilize them is the liver, even though it's the one that's making them. So the liver is actually missing out here. So now looking at how we actually go about this, we have to also remember some of the properties of acetyl-CoA that we talked about. We had talked about acetyl-CoA being an unusual metabolite that can act as an electrophile and as a nucleophile. And we had said at that stage that because of these properties, two molecules of acetyl-CoA also can condense with each other if one acts as a nucleophile and the other one acts as an electrophile. And that's actually exactly what is happening in ketogenesis where now in a scenario where you're starting to accumulate acetyl-CoA, you can have two molecules of acetyl-CoA be condensed with each other. In the process, you're actually releasing one molecule of your cofactor, again, your CoA. The outcome here is a C to acetyl CoA. You do not have to remember these structures or remember the name. All I want you to understand is sort of the basic mechanism that we're utilizing here. Following this condensation, we actually do a third condensation here. We're bringing in a third molecule of acetyl CoA, doing the same thing, and release one molecule of CoA, our cofactor. Now we get this larger structure here. And this one actually we can now cleave apart. And the products of this cleavage reaction is actually one molecule of acetyl-CoA. This actually can feasibly go back and undergo another of these reactions. And we get one molecule of acetoacetate. So I'll stop here before I go further into the pathway and just sort of highlight that what we have brought in, right, is two molecules of acetyl-CoA and one more here. So in total, three molecules of acetyl-CoA. And through these reactions of those three molecules of acetyl-CoA, we have released two of the CoA cofactors. So we're really solving our cofactor problem at this stage. But what we do with these compounds here? Acetyl-CoA, as I said, it could go back into this reaction. It could also go through the TCA cycle. That depends on the cellular conditions. 
But what do we do with acet acetate here? This one actually isn't very stable and it can fall apart even without any enzyme. And there are multiple things that can happen. The most common ones are that it can be decarboxylated to acetone or right, it can be reduced here at the carbonyl function to beta hydroxybutyrate. We're actually using up some more of our NADH cofactor here, so we also have to pay attention to that. But these two are the major outcomes of ketogenesis and this pathway. And these are actually two very important molecules here. Right? These ones here in your boxes, these are the ketone bodies. We have the capacity to utilize these for bringing about the de novo biosynthesis of acetyl-CoA again after transporting them to a destination tissue and cell for as long as they don't accumulate too much. So we can use them for energy. We won't go too much into the mechanism, how this works. It's rather complex. Just for now, keep in mind that we can use them to regenerate energy. But there is an issue if these accumulate too much. So if we're doing too much ketogenesis, and so this is actually of interest because if you're starting to accumulate acetone, acetone actually smells very strongly. And so if you're doing a lot of ketogenesis, you are accumulating ketone bodies, you'll be able to smell this in your breath. And this is actually what um, first responders often use if someone is unconscious, not responsive, and there is a suspicion it could be related to, for example, severe diabetes. Smelling the breath of a patient for acetone can really help to very rapidly establish if this might actually be the case. The other molecule here, hydroxybutyrate, right? if you have a close look at this molecule, right, it's an acid. So you really can imagine you don't want to accumulate that in your bloodstream. It can actually cause lots of issues. If you do accumulate, it starts to become toxic and contributes to ketoacidosis in diabetes. And this can lead to coma eventually. So this is a very helpful pathway if you need to recycle your CoA cofactor, but it also can be problematic in metabolism if you're running it too much, if you're accumulating these compounds at too high a level. So let's look at at least one scenario under which this can happen, right? So when are we forming ketone bodies? And we do so again, right, in the liver. So one really common cellular scenario is when our glucose concentration drops. So for example, you haven't eaten for a long time, your glucose levels drop, or you have diabetes, right? Especially in diabetic patients, ketogenesis is a very common phenomenon and must be monitored. Okay. But what happens? What happens if glucose concentration drops? How is this becoming an issue? Right? But if you're running out of glucose, remember, so especially your brain wants glucose, so you need to produce it, and the way to do it, right, as we have learned, is our GNG, our gluconeogenesis. So you're actually kickstarting now your gluconeogenesis in the liver to support increased precursor supply for glucose, right, and make glucose. In doing so, like if you are really running your GNG a lot, you require precursors to do so, and a lot of these precursors will come out of TCA cycle intermediates. So you are starting to draw increasingly on your TCA cycle in this scenario to support increased gluconeogenesis. As a result, right, if you do this, your TCA cycle will become inefficient, right? We had talked about the stoichiometric relationship that we have to always put metabolites back into the cycle. If you're drawing too much on it, the TCA cycle will actually become inefficient and have a lower, a decreased activity. But at the same time, you don't have glucose right now. If you don't have glucose right now, what you will actually increase at the same time is that you increase your fatty acid breakdown, but right? you need energy. If there's no glucose and sugars around, you will draw on your lipid resources first. So you increase fatty acid breakdown because there's no glucose available. But if you do this, right, you're starting to produce more and more acetyl-CoA, and now you're running into the issue of having a reduced DCA cycle that would decarboxylate acetyl-CoA and release a cofactor again while having more and more acetyl-CoA produced from fatty acid breakdown. So this is a realistic scenario where you can run into this cofactor problem. And so when acetyl-CoA actually accumulates, this signals the body to start ketone body formation. 
Another really interesting example on how this comes about is actually if you drank too much, right? If you had a really heavy Friday night, you had a lot of alcohol. If you remember how we dealt with alcohol, our ethanol catabolism was, right, we converted it into acetyl-CoA. So in addition to the alcohol being poisonous to your cells and slowing down metabolism as a whole, in order to actually break down the alcohol in your blood, you are increasing the production of acetyl-CoA and you can run into the same problem. So it's actually interesting that in alcoholism, for example, if there are severe cases of alcoholism, you can have similar symptoms of ketoacetosis as you would find in a diabetic patient because of this issue of accumulating acetyl-CoA.